If you'd open in your Bibles to Isaiah, it's the fifth longest book in the Bible. Uh, and if you don't know the books of the Bible, you just go to the middle, Psalms, and then go to the right, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. It's right there. We'll be in chapter one in just a moment. As you're turning there, uh, what we're looking at this morning is how do you minister in a culture that is declining, that is, that is morally exhausted and morally bankrupt, uh, where you see what we see. Uh, if you at all are in touch with the news, you know that so far this weekend, police officers have been injured in Seattle through riots, in Oakland, which is the poor part of San Francisco. Uh, of course, you know about Baltimore. I mean, burning down. In fact, I had a friend of mine that lives in the renovated Baltimore and was emailing, looking out their condo window, saying, they're on our block and they're breaking the, the store windows across the thing and they're burning the place, you know? And it's just, it was kind of like, are we talking about Syria here? Our Afghanistan? Where are... Is this Sudan? No, this is Baltimore. You know, Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner from Fort McHenry in the harbor. I mean, we're talking about, this is foundational to our country and we have riots and, and burnt police cars and unarmed people shackled with their hands. I mean, who knows what really happened but the Lord and the people there. But I mean, if even part of what they said happened, it's, it's horrifically wrong to injure someone while restrained. Uh, but we're living in a culture parallel to the world of 2,800 years ago. And God, this morning, told the children of Israel how they were to minister in a nation that was in the death throes, Israel declining, going off to destruction. And then, what you're gonna find at the end of our little time this morning, Jesus lifts the very first element of how they were to minister, which is fasting and compassion, and inaugurates his public ministry saying, in the same heart of Isaiah 58 to 61, my church is to go out. So basically, if I was to give you a thesis is, Christ wants us to have compassion and to have a heart that is moved by the suffering we see in our declining nation. So let me go through that with you because what does a nation look like that's dying? Israel is dying. Uh, and this is how God described Israel. What happens when a nation with a long and deep biblical heritage turns its back on God? Israel had a long and deep biblical heritage. God himself came down and dictated to Moses the law. And, and they had God, his presence, hovering over the center of their capital city, that Shekinah glory in both the tabernacle and later in the temple. How about a group of formerly devout followers of the Lord who mostly have abandoned genuine worship and godly behavior? God instructed what he wanted, they had abandoned it. What does God's word prescribe when a nation that formerly honored him slips into Eastern mysticism? Now, some of you think I'm talking about America. It is eerily similar. Israel abandoned the one true living God for Eastern mysticism. And they were all doing their lotus bows, sitting on the courtyard in, in all their relaxed, stretch positions, worshiping toward the sun. Very Eastern, very very much permeated by Satan's lies and New Age errors uh, and accepts and dabbles in witchcraft and occultic errors. Again, Israel was allowing witchcraft and all of its forms, astrology, uh, horoscopic living, uh, heptoscopic living. I mean, there were all these ways they told the future, diviners, and they they didn't want to ask God for his direction. They began asking the devil through through seances and, and, and uh, you know, tarot card type of things back then. And the nation plunged into materialism and greed and they allowed idolatry and false worship to thrive in, in God's place. What happens when, when God's word prescribes, or what does God's word prescribe when a formerly god honoring nation chooses a pathway of greedy overdevelopment of its land? Now here, I'm not talking again about what we see in America, which 
is so true. I mean, no normal person can afford to live in San Francisco today. There are so many billions of dollars awash in the technical, uh, you know, industry that we have that, that you can't even buy a house for under three quarters of a million. How many of us in this room or either service could afford a home? A few. But we're talking about a place where the poor are displaced because it's so much, I mean, tear those squatty houses down and let's put in towers where we can have $100 million condos. And, and, and the poor just, are, that was going on in Israel. And, and this incredible uh, overdevelopment that allows and enables a culture of alcohol and drug-fueled addictions, and you'll see that was going on in Israel, bent toward unrestrained, kind of a spring breakish parting among people. You know, the Bible talks about the worshiping Baal. Do you know what they did? They took their clothes off and they got intoxicated and they committed horrific sexual immorality. Kind of sounds like spring break in, in Florida beaches. There's such eerie parallels to our cultures. What does God prescribe? How are we supposed to reach out to a nation that was built on the moral law of God when it descends into a place where injustice towards the poor and helpless reigns? The whole Old Testament is about how judges were bribed by the rich to take from the poor the little that they had so the rich could get richer. We see eerie parallels today where the land becomes a place of what we're seeing on the television. Riots, police cars burned. In Israel, complete lawlessness. Finally, um, what does God's word prescribe when a nation formerly that revered God's word, a place where the king in his first year as king of Israel had to hand copy the first five books of the Old Testament by hand, he couldn't take it to Kinko's or you know, FedEx, Kinko's or to office, whatever. He had to hand write it so that he personally thought over and wrote down every word of God's law. That was the first year of the king's life. It took six to 800 hours to copy the Pentateuch by hand, by lamplight. And so God's word was revered from the top down are supposed to be. What happens when no longer is God's word revealed, when it becomes a place where truth is replaced with lies, kind of what we're seeing at the highest levels of academia, where absolutes are replaced with relativism. I mean, we, we kind of decide if something's right or wrong by public policy, by how many people are for it, you know? Uh, let's all just vote on this, whether it's right or wrong. Relativism, where cultural and ac- educational elitism begins to rule. You know what we see? There's a privileged class. There was then, you know, the Sadducees, the Pharisees in Christ's time, the the rich and the knowledgeable in, in Isaiah's time, where pride and arrogance are promoted. They're almost virtues. Arrogant, swaggering pride is extolled. That's the sign of of a nation in its when it when that is pandemic, it's a nation on the on the death rattle, where national heroes are actually people who are sexually immoral and often addicted to substances. That was going on in Israel, and that just described much of what's coming out of Hollywood. Sexually immoral people that are addicted. If you read the news, how many are in and out of the rehabs constantly? They can't stay married, they don't get married. They find someone to have their child so that they can parade them. And there are heroes. And the the lyrics they write, most people that are 40-something and down know them. They're heroes. Their songs are written on our hearts. Yet God says, why are you making them heroes when they're sexually immoral addicts? Why am I not your hero? That's interesting. And the, the similarities to our culture are eerie. Because everything I said, if you look at Isaiah 1, describes what was going on in the 8th century BC. But why are we in Isaiah? Why, why do we even, why do New Covenant, under grace, New Testament Christians even bother with the Old Testament? Well, let's think about how big Isaiah is. Uh, Isaiah is an amazing book in the Bible, it's the fifth longest. Uh, Jeremiah's longer, Psalms are longer, uh, you know, Genesis is longer. But 
it's quoted or alluded to in 23 of the 27 New Testament books, 472 times. Certainly the New Testament church needed Isaiah because they couldn't even prove their points without quoting from this book or alluding to it. It's also more references to salvation in all the other prophetic books put together. It describes more than any other book in the Bible two of the furthest reaching events from each other. Isaiah describes more about the fall of Satan and what, what the throne of God was like before sin entered and what the new heavens and new earth are like more than anyone else in the Bible. It's amazing what Isaiah is loaded with and, and what is vital. It, it has also more to say about God's character, about you know, the attributes of God, his goodness. In fact, it has, Isaiah 53 is the single most important chapter probably in the whole Old Testament because it personifies the substitute in the substitutionary atonement, in Jesus Christ. It personifies the Lamb of God and it tells us everything about what he did to redeem us. So Isaiah is an important book. Should New Testament saints know Isaiah? Yes. Why? Jesus said that Isaiah saw his glory. It, it, Jesus' virgin birth was, was most clearly identified by Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. So, yes, it's a vital book about inspiration, about the character of God. But basically, it's vital for us because it describes when a nation abandons God. And let me just, you got your Bibles open. Let, let me go through these and I'm gonna show you. Remember I just said all these things that you thought were describing America? Look at Isaiah 1, three to six. What happens when a nation with a biblical heritage turns its back on God? Look at verse three. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel doesn't know me, my people don't even consider me. Look at the end of verse four, they've turned away backward. I mean, what he said is, they've not only turned their back to me, they're walking away from me. They aren't walking away this way, looking at God and saying, sorry, we shouldn't be doing this. They just have, they just turned around and they're walking away. Verse six, from the sole of the foot even to the head, there's no soundness. He says, these people are, they are absolutely not following me, yet they're my chosen people. Look how rapidly, I, I just read a um, Bloomberg report, a timeline showing how fast societal change is occurring. And it showed how long it took America to finally come to the point they thought slavery was wrong. Uh, scores and scores and scores and scores and scores of years. How long did it take before they realized that women should be given equality in voting? Scores and scores and scores of years. How long did it take for them to decide about prohibition? Decades and decades and decades. How long did it take to, and, and you know, it just, it went through that and it says, but look what's happened in the last 10 years. Abortion, uh, the, the uh, uh, redefinition of marriage. It showed a graph that it takes, it's taking what used to take scores of years and then decades and years now takes a matter of months before society says, eh, we're not sure what God said. The Bible's irrelevant anyway. Let's just do whatever is nice to everybody except God. We don't want to offend anybody but God. And so that's the mantra of today. Look at verse 11. How about people who have abandoned genuine worship? The Lord says, what is the purpose of a multitude of sacrifices to me? America has more churches, more billions of dollars of churches than anywhere else. In fact, more than all the rest of the world combined of square footage of facilities, of churches. And I'm not talking about mosques, and I'm not talking about Buddhist temples. I'm talking about churches, supposedly to God. Yet, Jesus Christ is been redefined as not divine. And his word is no longer infallible or inerrant or even relevant. And where the people's behavior, in fact, look what it says, verse 12, when you come and appear before me, uh, who has required this from you to trample my courts? He says, he says, you're coming in just like a herd and you're coming in with no reverence. You don't even know, as verse 11, your sacrifices aren't even to me. And verse 14, he says, my soul hates and, and they are troubled to me. I'm weary of bearing them. He says, he says, the worship that's being offered by people whose heart is far from me is sickening to me. And the worship, he said, sickens me. 
Real parallel between 2,800 years ago and today. Look at Isaiah chapter two and verse six. This is what he says in six. You have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with Eastern ways. See, the new age mysticism, Isaiah 2, 6, had flown in and crept in and, and diluted Israel. And it wasn't just that. They were also accepting at the end of verse six, dabbling in witchcraft. Look what it says. The soothsayers like the Philistines and they're pleased with all the children of the foreigners. All these philosophies and ideas and, and, and power and, and how to get, you know, how to relax and let something outside of you control you, which is the whole idea of, of mysticism and the Eastern religions. He said, that's taken over instead of the living true God that's in your midst. You turn your back and are going away from him. And you're going toward uh, what we have nowadays is an oxymoron, Christian yoga. Now that's like saying, uh, you know, a, a, what, what's the one that they had? A jumbo shrimp. That's an oxymoron too. But did you know yoga, there, there was an article I just read in New York Times by a man from India. He's the one that, that promotes a return in India to yoga. He said, the Americans, they think it's an exercise. He said, it's not an exercise. He said, it's an invitation to the great spirit power out there. And by the way, it's not God. He didn't define it. It's an invitation to the devil to empty your mind and take all restraint away and get into a point where you allow something to fill you and energize. Christian yoga? Uh-uh. It's, it's an invitation. And Israel's doing it. Uh, look at verse seven. They were into materialism and greed. Chapter two, verse seven. Their land is full of silver and gold. There's no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses. There's no end to their chariots. I mean, I mean, look at our chariots. You get a, you get a chariot for 80,000, 100,000. You get it loaded, 120,000. Look at the new high-end cars. I mean, low-end cars are hard to find. It's just everybody is just worshiping the material and you've got to be surrounded by comfort. Their land is full of idols, verse eight. Uh, they worship the works of their own hands. That is, that is so back then and now. Then uh, chapter five, look at this. The nation chooses greedy overdevelopment. Look, you say, is that in there? Yeah, they join house to house, they add field to field till there's no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. Do you know what the new way of cleaning up a city is? You renovate it so much like San Francisco that no poor person can fit in that city. They can't even buy bottled water. And, and, and that is supposed to be positive. I mean, crime should be down. Yeah, they moved it all to Oakland, you know? They moved it all outside of, you know, the rich parts of San, uh, St. Louis or outside of the rich parts of the Beltway. Put it out with uh, there where the people can't afford it and where they have no place. I mean, I'm not... Uh, all I'm saying is, this is not new. If you wanna read an indictment on a lot of what's going on in America, read the Minor Prophets. God says, when you oppress the people that are helpless, you're oppressing me. And so how do you minister in a, in a culture of alcohol and drug-fueled addictions? Look at verse 11. Woe to those, they rise early that they may follow intoxicating drink and continue all night. And they play the music in verse 12 and they don't regard the works of the Lord. They're so amused and distracted. They don't even consider, and the New America puts it, they don't even pay attention to God. Th that's where we are. And, and look what it leads to. Look at verse 12. Uh, I mean, verse 18, woe to those, they draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as with a cart rope. What, what they're saying is that what Isaiah is illustrating is the people were so laden with sins, they didn't want to let go of any of them, so they put a cart behind them and they put sins in the cart and they're pulling them with a rope going through life, overflowing with sin and pulling more with them. And that's what I call kind of the spring breakish partying that we see so much in America. And then look at verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good, this new redefinition, revisionism, relativism, and they call good evil. I mean, uh, uh, we can't allow any 
any even implication of God. We want to erase him. We don't want any of that stuff. Uh, they put darkness for light and switch light for darkness. They put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And if that's not enough, here comes the elitism and pride and arrogance there. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, prudent in their own sight. And on top of all that are these horrible heroes. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's, that's what Isaiah said. What does God's word prescribe when, in verse 23, when justice is, the, you justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man, there's injustice. And then look at verse 24 at the end of it. Because you've rejected the law of the Lord of hosts, you're lawless, despise the word of the Holy One of Israel, you're irreverent. I mean, Israel got there and we're fast approaching. Well, so the question is, how are we supposed to respond to that? Are we supposed to move to the thumb of Michigan and build a bunker, get a shotgun? I was reading an article, it says, it says the ratcheting of a shotgun with some dangerous people in your presence usually makes them leave. So, you know, we should all have a shotgun by our door and, and, and you know, put the shells through it to let them know we're ready to blast them. Is it to get more security, to protect more and more stuff for us because they don't deserve it, they didn't earn it, they didn't go to school, they don't have it, we do and it's ours and we're gonna sit on it and let them starve. You know, I mean, is that, I mean, how are, what, what kind of attitude does God project in his word? Well, let's turn to Isaiah 58 because Isaiah 58 is the prescription what God called, called his people to do. He called them to have what I call an operating system. Uh, what, what is supposed to be running in the background of our minds, living in a morally declining nation just like Israel lived in 2,800 years ago? What did God call the people who had ears to hear, the believers, the saints of 2,800 years ago who were living with injustice, who were living with greed and materialism and, and people that were heroes at their wicked lifestyles? What did God call them to do? He said, you should have an operating system of compassion because that's what Christ had. And, and let me show you what I mean by compassion. Uh, this, this compassion is, is in Isaiah 58, starting in verse 6. In fact, I will, I will go through the whole list of them. Look at, look at what the Lord says uh, we should have. Compassion for captives in oppression, those who are, are totally trapped by their oppression. For the hungry, the homeless, the cold, the suffering, those discriminated against, and just basically all the needy ones. Verse 6. Is not this the fast... I have chosen. What God said is, you're going through this mindless worship. Those of you that hear my voice, what I want you to do is to be involved in a spiritual discipline and exercise that causes these things to pr be promoted in your life. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. He said, I want you to have compassion and look at people, whether they're rich or poor, and see that they are truly, desperately needy. Now, I'll just give you one little example. In, in my little world that I live, I'm always looking for unsaved people because, you know, when you work at the church, we expect most people here to be Christians, you know, and so I'm surrounded by people that already know the Lord. How do you evangelize? And so I really look on everywhere I go and I try and pick out different individuals that I try and share the gospel with. And one of those that I've been befriending lately, I noticed that one of the strange things or unusual or unique things about them is that they're constantly putting whatever it is on their hair. And I'm not talking about, you know, normal hair color. I mean, we're talking about chartreuse green, glittery gold. I mean, they just, I don't know if you paint that on or what, but it's just like, Wow, you've never seen red, purple, you know, yellow, everything. And so last week I walked up and I said, hey, I said, did you know your hair is the primary color of heaven? She said, what? I said, of heaven. She said, 
she touched her hair, she said, this green? I said, yeah, that's the primary color. The throne of God is an emerald hue. She said, how did you know that? I said, it's in the Bible. So the next time I saw her, she had a whole different color and she went, you know, <laughs> is that one in the Bible? I mean, she now, every time I see her, talks to me because she's made a, a connection with me, her hair color and the Bible. And all she knows about me is I noticed her hair and I know the Bible. And, and do you know why she does all that? Because there is an emptiness that she's trying to fill with acceptance or being noticed or something. She is a captive to the oppression of sin. She doesn't know the Lord. Neither do most of the wealthiest people of this world. And neither do many of the poorest of this world. And God describes all of them as captives. They're spiritually handicapped, they're spiritually blind, and they're totally bound by the cords of their sin. So the Lord says, you should have a compassion for them. Look at verse seven. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? Did you know we're supposed to have a compassion for hungry people? If we know of people that do not have enough food to make it, and we don't respond to that. Do you know what the Bible says? How does the love of Christ dwell in your heart? Jesus was moved when he saw people in need. He didn't move away from them. He moved toward them. That's what he says. He says, how do you deal in a culture that's, that's disintegrating? You have compassion for the people that are oppressed, for those that are hungry, for those in verse seven that, that do not have a place. Bring them into your house, the poor that are cast out. I mean, I was raised in Lansing and my parents who, my mom didn't work, my dad worked at General Motors hourly. We lived in a less than 900 square foot house with five of us. We had one bathroom, yet they brought home new converts from the mission the Lansing City Rescue Mission. If someone came forward and got saved, gave their life to Christ and wanted to have a fresh start, my parents would help them with that, getting started, getting back into life. And sometimes it worked gloriously and sometimes they took anything they could stuff in their pockets from our house. We're supposed to, it, it isn't, well, if no one hurts me, I'll do this. If no one, if it doesn't cost me any money, if it doesn't injure or risk anything, I'll do it. No. Compassion for the homeless has its price. And for the cold, for those that don't have enough clothing, for uh, uh, those who are suffering, verse seven, look how it ends. Don't hide yourself from your own flesh. Don't, those are people out there. They're not statistics, they're not rioters. They are, they, they're people that are rioting, but they're, they're humans that we're to have compassion for. And those who are discriminated against, look at the end of verse nine. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness, this is prejudice and sarcasm and, and, and the whole bad talking about, and it, did you know it is not godly to make fun of homosexual people? It is, it is, there's nothing that God is honored by mocking the, all of these trans and, I mean, what you see in the newspaper happening to Bruce Jenner is not funny and it's not to be mocked. It's horrible. You know, our Olympic guy, Bruce Jenner, who's becoming a woman, that's because of the depth of his hurt on the inside. That, that he is rejecting what God made him and became, becoming what he can make himself. We're not supposed to mock that. There should never be a place for racial or moral jokes. God says, compassion from me makes, makes that, that type of discrimination, whether it's racial or their sexual orientation, we never are to, to point the finger and mock them. And then finally, Compassion for the needy, verse 10. Extend your soul to the hungry. That's compassion. Satisfy the afflicted soul. That's relief ministry. And what's the benefit of that? Verse 10, your light will dawn like the darkness. Your darkness will be like noonday. And the Lord, verse 11, will guide you continually. Lots of good blessings from Christ-like compassion. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. Now, to end, before we go to communion, let's turn to Luke chapter four. 
And this is a, a truncated version, and, and of course, you know me, we will certainly revisit all this again, uh, because I'm saying it so fast, especially Isaiah 58. But Jesus ministered to the oppressed, and when Jesus launched his ministry, he, he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke chapter four, and, and he asked to be the one that speaks and and they gave him the scroll and he opened it up to Isaiah and he went to chapter 61 of Isaiah. Uh, By the way, the chapter numbers weren't in there until the 12th century AD. He just went to that part of the scroll. It wasn't dictated by or inspired by God with chapters. But he went to where we see in Isaiah 61 and that's what it says in verse 18. So look at Luke 4, 18. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. And then look what he describes those who need the gospel. The poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Now if you track with Isaiah 61, That last line really doesn't sound like that in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. That's because Jesus actually pulls the word from Isaiah 58, 6. That word oppressed is the very same word that we just read in Isaiah 58, 6. See, Jesus knew the the scriptures in and out. And he said that, that I am primarily called to minister to these oppressed. The gospel he came to proclaim is to explain the way that we are to look at those who live around us. We're supposed to look at everyone that lives around us. Look back at verse 18. As poor, brokenhearted, captives, blind, and oppressed. But we don't. We look at this, the, the new rich of Silicon Valley and, and the entertainment industry. They're, they're the rich and they kind of like, they don't need anything from us. In fact, we would like to be like them sometimes. And we look at the poor as only those who are economically poor or morally poor. Of course, that would cover the Hollywood crowd. But you know what I mean? We, we differentiate. We actually see people by their economic status and educational status. And you know what fasting is to do? Change that. We're supposed to see everyone, from Warren Buffett and Mr. Tesla guy, uh, Musk, uh, and, and uh, all of the San Francisco crowd, you know, the Apple Nistas and everybody, we're supposed to see all of them as verse 18. Poor, because it doesn't matter how much money you have. You are born with a black hole emptiness of hopelessness. And you try and stuff as much in as you can, but they're actually spiritually totally bankrupt and poor. And secondly, brokenhearted. I mean, why do people do the crazy things they do? Because their, their heart is not operating. They, they are, uh, they're trying to become a woman because they, they had such a bad time being a man. And it's just tragic, the, the brokenheartedness and the, the blindness. They don't understand anything about God or his will or his plan or his, his inviolable uh, eternal precepts. They don't even, I mean, they are blind to all that and they're oppressed. In fact, what, what Isaiah 58 is saying, we need to see people through Christ's eyes and stop seeing financially rich and poor and start seeing everybody spiritually poor, everybody spiritually bankrupt. Jesus came to those who are oppressed. The word Jesus uses here speaks not of someone in jail or prison, it's used for someone that's imprisoned by life. When you see those rioters, they're imprisoned by their lives and they're imprisoned by their sins. And so are all of us, all the way up the spectrum. And the gospel is the only thing that liberates. And we're supposed to have the liberated life and go tell them how we got liberated. It's people overwhelmed by the pains of life, by abusive relationships, someone overwhelmed by illness or financial woes or all the other endless struggles of life. They are overwhelmed, they are afflicted, they are joyless, they are hopeless, and they're empty. And Jesus said, I came to those who know it that will acknowledge their bankruptcy, their hopelessness, their lostness. And if they will confess that, He said, I will save them. Jesus left us to share the gospel of salvation 
He left us to point people to Jesus, who said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, those of you that are oppressed by life, and, and you can't go on, and, and you, you are pondering ending your life like, like a higher and higher percentage of young people across this globe are doing, because life has no hope, no possibility. They'll never dig themselves out of the ditch they're in. God wants us to focus on why it is we're here. We're supposed to be living redemptively. We're ambassadors of reconciliation. We say your real problem is not finances. Your real problem is not that you didn't have a, an Ivy League education. Your real problem is not that you don't have a Silicon Valley job. Your real problem is that you have a void and emptiness and a, a horrific godlessness in your life. And that's why you're trying to become something you weren't created to be. And that's why you're destroying your mind and your body and amusing yourselves to nirvana. But I'd like to introduce you to the one whose arms are open like mine are to you. And I will point you and share with you how he changed me. Because I was equally as desperately evil. That's another thing we do. We think oh, those homosexuals, they're really bad. My pride and arrogant and kind of gluttonous life is not as bad as theirs. Mm -hmm. That's how we think. We're addicted to other things. One of the things the Messiah does is come to the person who's overwhelmed and oppressed. And what is that oppression? It's sin. It's sin. It's the burden of sin. The wearying burden of sin, the weight of the law, and unable to keep God's righteous standard. God will come, the Messiah will come, and he will take the whole burden of their sin, the whole burden of trying to keep the law, and give you rest. That's what we tell people. You don't even realize what's, what's driving you. You are, you are under the law of sin and death, and it's crushing you. And and I was a similar crushed person, and I found the escape route. Kind of reminds me of, remember the Twin Towers and how uh, the firemen went up and led the people through the smoke and, and showed them how to get out, and people couldn't see it, and they couldn't breathe, and they just trusted them. We're going in the 911 tower, Twin Towers of New York City, the World Trade Center, in the smoke and darkness, and we're holding the hands of these people, and show, if they want, showing them the way out. He comes to poor prisoners, blind and oppressed by sin. He takes them and makes them spiritually rich. Spiritually rich, that's why this gospel, even in Kalamazoo, that God wants you to be rich and healthy, is not from God. God never said that. I don't want you rich, I want you healthy. I'd like you poor and sickly if you'll serve me and have my attention on me. God says, I want your attention. Paul said, today is the day of salvation. It's time for the poor prisoners, blind and oppressed, to come to Messiah and be forgiven and receive salvation. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has come to rescue us forever from our spiritual poverty, our spiritual prison, our spiritual blindness, and our spiritual oppression. And he's come to give us riches and freedom and sight and deliverance. And he wants us to do his ministry of telling others how he did that for us so that we can take them with us to heaven. So how do you minister to a society in its death throes? You live out the gospel by letting Jesus Christ set us free, open our eyes, and enrich us with his gracious presence and spend the rest of our life undistracted by everything the rest of the world is canoeing toward materialism and self-centeredness. And we go upstream looking at anybody that will listen to us and we share the gospel and say, Follow me as I'm following Christ. So this communion can be a wonderful time for us to say, Lord, I would like to do whatever it takes to start cultivating this kind of a heart of compassion like you had, Lord Jesus. I want your compassion. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer, and as we do, I invite the men to uh, prepare to serve us communion. The elders and deacons are gonna go out and we're gonna bow before the Lord and invite his work in our hearts. And Father in heaven, we ask that as Paul told the Colossians chapter three, 12 to 14, that we would put on as the elect of God, holy and beloved, compassion. 
I pray that we would have your heart for those around us that that are well-dressed and poorly dressed, but both of them are spiritually bankrupt. Both of them are equally horrifically handicapped in blindness, and they're pulling around carts of sin. Refined sins for the rich and unrefined sins for the poor, but sin, and all equally need the gospel of you, O Christ, delivering us from the death row we all sit on, taking our place on the cross, and tell them that, hallelujah, what a savior we have. I pray that this communion would be a time when, when you stir our hearts toward the compassion you desire to see this crumbling society around us, not to protect our assets from them, but to immerse ourselves in sharing the gospel with them. And in a thousand years, we will forget our assets and we will rejoice in what investments we made in people for eternity. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for this bread that reminds us that you are the sin bearer and our sins are on you. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen.